first part of my talk will just give a little background on uh, the notion of disciplinary knowledge and the, uh, and the history of how it came to be the dominant way that we organized knowledge. And then I will review the major terms that we're now using today to talk about interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, and now transdisciplinarity, and what they mean and what they mean for research in, uh, in consciousness and transformation. And then finally, I'll end with a few observations about the institutional obstacles to uh, uh, our bringing this interdisciplinary focus to the study of what has traditionally been thought of as a set of disciplinary problems. So, let me start with um, the backstory on multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity. The notion of disciplinary knowledge actually goes back at least as far as the Greeks. Aristotle, for example, divided knowledge into uh, several, uh, uh, so, uh, several categories, but, um, uh, and, and he saw these as uh, inherently hierarchical, but he also believed that the division of knowledge, though necessary, was, uh, could be a very problematic thing. And so underlying his notion of disciplines was the concept that philosophy united all of them. Philosophy seen as a common approach to knowledge, a common set of methods of considering uh, the world and knowledge, and really a common language in which people who might have different interests in, uh, in, in ways of studying the world and human life and human thought could still talk to each other and converse in ways that brought their knowledge together. And this notion that even though knowledge had to be pursued in, in certain disciplinary ways, that there needed to be a, uh, a uniter, uh, a, a sense that there, was, um, uh, that there was a fundamental unity of all knowledge. Uh, the, the, there's still a reflection of this today in the fact that we receive doctors of philosophy um, it, it, it sometimes seems archaic uh, that uh, biochemists receive a doctor of philosophy, but it comes from this sense that knowledge is really all one. And even the concept of the university came from that same uh, belief that knowledge is one. The term, the word university in Latin means whole or universal. And so it is indicative of this same um, hope that uh, really was um, operative until the late 18th century. Um, in the, even at the end of the 18th century, students studied, uh, even though they, they might specialize in law or mathematics or a branch of the sciences, all students at a university studied a basic liberal core that uh, we know of as the trivium and the quadrivium. The trivium being logic, grammar, and rhetoric, and the quadrivium being arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, music. Um, and so this notion that this community of like-minded scholars who shared a certain base of liberal learning could still talk to each other was, um, was, was operative. Um, even as recently as uh, you know, a, a little over 200 years ago. It was really in the early 19th century that um, the way we think of disciplines now as being separated from each other in methods and materials and in objects of study became the dominant way of looking at uh, the organization of knowledge. Um, the uh, strict separation began 
with the explosion of scientific knowledge uh, and the, the hopes and dreams of practical applications of that knowledge, which took the sciences out of and beyond the um, other forms of knowledge and created a f kind of hierarchy within knowledge that had never been there before, a hierarchy that placed science not as first among equals, but as first. And science began to organize itself um, in a way that it organized itself in its knowledge in a way that was different from the other disciplines. And that was the beginning of what we, what we know of now as disciplinarity. And that, um, uh, that, that continued as, uh, uh, and, and were pushed forward as, particularly as discoveries in science um, mounted and, uh, uh, and, and became uh, increasingly a uh, subject of uh, intense curiosity. Uh, the sciences separated from the rest, from the body of disciplinary knowledge at this time in a, in a rather, um, in a way that was rather different from their separation at earlier periods. Um, and there were not just um, knowledge ramifications of this, but also institutional ramifications as well. You know, with a hierarchy, with a formal hierarchy, um, and separation comes uh, competition for resources, competition for um, prestige, and so forth. And so institutional barriers began to be put in place that separated the disciplines even further, not just by what they were looking at, but by what by how they were ranked and how they were positioned within the hierarchy of the university. And as a result of this, um, other areas of studies began to organize themselves also as disciplines. Um, there are many interesting books on the rise, for example, of the discipline of English, the study of English literature. It's quite fascinating, quite contentious. Uh, history. And uh, in many cases, disciplines began to model themselves on the sciences as a way of attempting to um, get the same goodies that the sciences were getting and get the same institutional preferences that the sciences were getting. Um, it also was a belief that, um, that organized knowledge could, uh, that organized methods of pursuing knowledge could lead to disinterested knowledge. Disinterested knowledge would be a knowledge then uh, that would be located within a discipline, would be created through the methodologies that were proper to that discipline, and that would reflect the, uh, the, cons uh, the concerns the, the uh, intellectual concerns of, pers of those who pursue that discipline. And increasingly those became further and further apart until in the 19, it, it, you know, when we get into the 20th century, um, and particularly in the United States, where uh, with the proliferation of um, uh, land-grant universities, of uh, public education, and the widespread um, entry into um, education of people who would not have been thought suitable for it uh, at an earlier time, and a concomitant need for more workers in highly specialized fields, this specialization of knowledge began to become what we know of now as, a, um, as, a, as an almost vocational uh, orientation to disciplinary training. And so this, this, this went a far piece, as we say, this went a far piece from this original notion of people who thought about particular areas but came from the same place. Now, we long, 
I think we in academia uh, long for the uh, uh, that 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 past long left behind. We uh, are increasingly aware that specialization is not an answer to all questions. Um, as we look, for example, at the destruction of our uh, uh, ecological systems, um, we know that we can approach those with the tools that have been developed um, separately. Uh, even the question that has concerned us all term, the question of consciousness, uh, it is quite clear that there there needs to be a coming together in a way that uh, has been uh, missing for a long time from the university. And so, for the at least the last 30 years, there have been concerted efforts of very in various forms to seek out ways to to bring together what had been separated. And there, these are called by various terms, and they have various, uh, uh, diff there are various differences among the ways that they are, um, uh, that they try to heal the breach. <coughs> we'll start by, with the notion of multidisciplinarity. I mean, this is, this is sometimes called handshake scholarship where people get in a room, they come with their particular perspectives, and they, uh, they have a common end. They want to do something in common, but they don't necessarily choose common means. Uh, a really good example of that is um, patient care. For a long time, uh, multidisciplinary teams have tried to deal with the complex illnesses of someone who has either multiple diagnoses or they have a complex illness like can uh, cancer. Um, everybody treats, looks at the patient from their own point of view and then they get in a room and they try to duke it out. They try to find a common way to treat that patient based on what they've all brought to the table. Um, uh, similarly, a lot of the uh, questions that have come up in New Orleans post-Katrina um, have been approached with multidisciplinary teams that involve engineers, um, uh, aquatic biologists, um, uh, people who are specialists in the uh, ecology of deltas, and uh, so forth. But what, but what kept them apart is often what poses the greatest challenge when they try to come back together. You've ever tried to be on a multidisciplinary team. One of the most difficult problems, of course, is the lack of commonality of language and of um, and of uh, uh, often methodology. And so we have a another term that is used a lot, which is uh, interdisciplinarity. We use it a great deal when we issued our um, um, RFP for our first group of grants, for example, uh, we made one of the uh, criteria for judging the grants whether people could come to the table with an interdisciplinary team uh, who would uh, work together. Uh, and the, the interdisciplinarity is defined a million ways. You get 10 people in a room and 10 people will give you a, a different definition of it. But the, the commonalities in the definition are that there is an attempt to identify common principles or common methodologies that can be brought uh, to bear on whatever the problems are. And I'm going to use NCC as an example because they, their um, approach to education is um, a, a classic interdisciplinary strategy because it identifies for, uh, for the education of its students a common core of seven competencies that cross disciplinary boundaries that, are, that define what it means to graduate as an NCC educated student. It really define the, the NCC vision of what an educated person is. 
Um, they, they, they work in, in interdisciplinary teams. Uh, their courses, their, particularly their first year uh, coursework uh, known as Cornerstones, which I've been privileged to be part of in little ways over the years, um, their first year courses are designed to combine the insights of disciplines um, to approach important problems that that may uh, that may that are um, defined in the separate sections of the course. And the NCC people can talk a little bit more about that. But it is a um, it is an attempt to bring together the benefits of disciplines within a structure that tries to um, at the same time break down the obstacles to using all of what the disciplines bring in a, uh, in, in a, in a an approach to um, a kind of holistic knowledge. And interdisciplinarity has been the major reigning paradigm in, um, in the academic world as an ideal of how to deal, how to get back, get back to philosophy, so to speak. Um, and and it, it, is, um, it is really the progenitor and base of the paradigm that is now becoming um, the most talked about and most um, thought about um, paradigm. And we've mentioned it several times. And that is the paradigm of transdisciplinarity. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit I'm going to read you um, a little selection from a man named Ron Burnett, who is very involved with this, a fascinating person who wrote a book called How Images Think. And, uh, and then show you three little examples of how in my own world, transdisciplinarity is changing the face of how we do things. Transdisciplinarity is an attempt to reinstate a common base of knowledge. It is an attempt to develop new paradigms, new conceptual frameworks, and new research tools that allow disciplines to talk to each other in new ways, to bring to bear their knowledge out of a common framework. Rather than just meeting around a problem, they develop, they, they develop tools and perspectives that Allow the pro allow problems to develop for them. You know what can they approach with these? There is an intense focus on how disciplines can talk to each other. You know that is the biggest obstacle. If whenever you begin a project that crosses disciplinary boundaries, this is a the, the part of the project of transdisciplinarity is the study of how knowledge flows itself among areas that are intensely different in their methodologies and in their concerns. And a final and really interesting characteristic of some of the best work that's being done um, in transdisciplinarity is that it often goes beyond the knowledge gained in disciplines to assimilate knowledge from outside of itself. For example, it is a place where non-expert knowledge can be taken into the equation and given a serious hearing. And my examples will address a little bit of this. It also tries to bring to bear in new ways knowledge that comes through somatic experience and through experiential learning. And, uh, and, and there are, there, are, there are many different ways that people are going about transdisciplinary paradigms. Um, the, uh, the, the leading paradigms are being developed by um, uh, people in, in various fields of science and technology who are trying to find common places to begin so that they don't have to keep talking to each other at cross purposes. For example, um, in some of these uh, transdisciplinary efforts, people will start with the notion of a particular technology, such as nanotechnology. 
they will work from what, what they know about nanotechnology and work outward from it to find out what can happen when a bunch of people who bring different sets of knowledges um, consider the possibilities of nanotechnology. There are also um, um, other ways of approaching this, and I'm going to give you examples of them from my, my fields of interest. Uh, they're much, much better to talk about this in specific than to, uh, to uh, generalize about it. Transdisciplinarity in the world of investigating um, uh, the, the visual. Um, uh, it can be seen in the work of a uh, man who is all, usually described as an art historian, but he's sort of, he, he's an interdisciplinarian to begin with. Um, uh, his name is James Elkins. He was here a couple of years ago giving a talk. And in a wonderful book called The Domain of Images, Elkins works with scientists, with geographers, with people in, in engineering, in higher mathematics, and redefines the field of interesting visual objects to study beyond the world of pretty things made by people identified as artists. And I'll just show you an example of what it is that Elkins would have us study. And these images, the top image is an image from a CCD that, uh, and shows the amount of noise that occurs in the raw, the, the raw feed from the, uh, to the CCD. The second image below is that same, uh, is that same image process. Now, who the heck would think to look at these images from the point of view of visuality, you know, we usually think of them in terms of the, you know, electrical, uh, you know, what what they can do for us, what happens when there's noise in in a, a photograph. But what Elkins is asking us to do is to consider these images, first of all, as objects of contemplation. You know, they're often placed in books for us to look at. How do we read them? How do we understand them? How is looking at this different from and the same as works that are read as works of art? What does it do to say that images like this have a similar claim upon our understanding as do works of art? Now, of course, Elkins is a very determined man, and he has many answers to this that are very specific. But what I love is that he, in fact, has opened up a world of questions, a world of questions that ultimately will have us ask ourselves, what does, what does visual exploration have to do with the way we pose research problems for ourselves? And so what exactly is that? this is a, 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 the image of noise of an, uh, that is produced by a noisy CCD, charge couple device, the, uh, you know, the collector thingy, mm -hmm. you know. And then the, the one below it is that noise corrected. And, a, and actually the, the progenitors of these images um, used it in a book, in, in a, as an essay in a book called Images of Power. And the, this image was used as a, a demonstration of um, our <clears throat> of how we respond to chaotic systems. All right, the second example I'm going to give you <laughs> is uh, a project called the Fundreds Project. That um, actually uh, Suzanne Scott and I were teaching a course together. We just had our students involved in this. And the Fundreds Project was founded, uh, but was started by an artist by the name of Mel Chin, um, who went to New Orleans right after the disaster and had to ask himself, what can an artist do? What, what, is, what good is an artist in this situation? 
and he went away discouraged. But then he assembled a, a team of people to help him think about what an artist can do. And he drew on his past collaborations with scientists and, uh, and bio with biologists and ecologists and, and on the history of New Orleans and determined that the, um, uh, the, the, the past of New Orleans was already a disaster before the flood ever came. And much of that disaster had to do with the lead in the soil. And working with his team of artists, with his team of, of scientists, he came up with a way to very simply and relatively inexpensively encapsulate the lead in the soil with a simple solution that could be placed over the ground. But then, of course, how do you pay for this? Well, being an artist and working with community activists and political thinkers and political scientists, part of his whole multi transdisciplinary team, came up with the idea that they would draw $300 million in fund rates, which are $100 bills. Children all over the country, and some adults, would be asked to draw their, their hopes and dreams for New Orleans. And then an armored car, when enough fund rates had been drawn, an armored car would go around the country, <coughs> collect them, bring them to Congress, and say, please trade this for real money to go down and fix the disaster before the disaster. Aside from being an enormous consciousness changing device for people throughout the country who've been involved with this, it shows the creativity of transdisciplinary thinking, bringing together people in a room who would never be together, and yet, and, and who, through a single through a, through a single desire, through a single set of, uh, of, of ways of looking at things, came up with this incredibly creative approach to an, a, a, a situation that was essentially biochemical. And then the final one is uh, a group called, uh, a, a transdisciplinary group called the Planetary Collegium. This is located at the uh, University of Plymouth. It gives doctorates. Um, it is a place that promotes the integration of art, science, technology, and consciousness research in a post-biological culture. And they, the, um, uh, uh, they have a, an annual conference every year called Consciousness Reframe. They just had one in Milan. Sorry, we all missed it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to demonstrate again the power of the planetary collegium's mindset by looking at a specific work of one of their alumni, Eduardo Kapp. It's a doctorate from the planetary collegium. And Kapp is very interested in what uh, the planetary collegium calls moist media, the meeting of technology, dry media, with wet media, which is us, biology. Uh, us and our planet, all of that. Um, and the project that uh, best represents this, um, this process is called the GFP Bunny. Now, it looks like some dumb conceptual art project, but in fact, it is a demonstration of the very notion of what transdisciplinarity means especially when it is implemented in uh, the world of art. This um, uh, CAC worked with a group of scientists in France to, um, uh, uh, to create this transgenic animal, uh, the uh, glowing, uh, the proteins that cause glowing in a um, kind of sea kelp were uh, uh, spliced into the genes of the bunny. The bunny is not really green, this is a, um, uh, an enhanced uh, version, but uh, the eyes and ears and skin of this albino bunny can be seen to glow with this green uh, protein under fluorescent light. And you might think, again, you know, well, what about the bunny? This is a, you know, ethically a problematic thing. But actually, CAC worked with a team of people 
to develop a project in which all of the complexities would be right out there. The goal of this project was not to display a bunny. It was to see what happens when you make a bunny and then have to deal with the consequences. Now, what are the human consequences of, trans, of making transgenic animals? What are the human consequences of the genetic engineering that we do all the time? How are you going to know this? Well, you know it by doing it and by studying intensely what happens. And one, one of the first consequences was part of Cack's experiment, his research, was he was going to bring the animal home and have it live with his family. But because of the laws that prevent the importation or exporting, in this case, of transgenic animals, he could not take it to, to his home in England. He had to, it, it's, it's had to live in France where it was. And, it's become, and, and the project took off from there. There's a tremendous amount more to it that I'm not going to go into here. But the goal of all of this is to incorporate knowledge that isn't necessarily thought of as part of, a knowledge, the, of the traditional academic knowledge-seeking project. It's to understand not just how we know things and how we learn things and how we discover things, but what it all means. And in a sense, that takes us right back to the notion of this philosophy below the, the, the uh, knowledges. And, and of course, it's done in much more serious and uh, immediately recognizable ways in other fields. But these are the ones I knew best, and I thought I'd give these to you. And, and, and I mean, I bring it up, too, because it's a logical mode for consciousness research, because consciousness is such a complex problem, as we've talked. But most of all, because transdisciplinary is, a, a, a transdisciplinary is about changing the consciousness of the researchers themselves. Mm -hmm. But, oops, we still have the institution that grew up around the disciplines. How do you evaluate in tenured faculty, tenure faculty whose work is primarily transdisciplinary? How do you account, I mean like in accounting systems, for team teaching? We've had to do all kinds of tricks to make it happen in our, in our world. How do you assign resources to interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary programs? How do you shape a career? How do you publish work in, a, in an institution that is bound up in disciplinary journals and and book and, and book publishers. So I'll end on problems. <laughs> okay, I think we have our Suzanne Scott is going to be the person who's going to oh. give the first response, correct? Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's what I was informed of. So okay. Wow. It's a <laughs> I know Lynn really well, and I've heard about that GFP bunny so many times, and it's like taco burrito every time. It's a, it's in a new um, setting, and it to me that sort of exemplifies the whole uh, transdisciplinary nature of of uh, your work, and um, you know I, I, I'm very excited about. Uh, the idea of interdisciplinarity, and I feel like I'm interdisciplinary at base. Um, but I do, I just have to go with the problems. You know, I, I also see that interdisciplinarity isn't really valued highly in academia and in the university, that I feel like we're always having to fight to claim our spot, and I wonder uh, how we deal with that. I think that one just stays on the table until we have Jeanette's response. Thank you. Um, my name is Jeanette Muir, and I've been in uh, Associated Century College since its beginning, uh, as Leslie and Suzanne are also part of it, and, and others 
peripherally involved in Lynn. And, um, and I also, my discipline is communication, though it's kind of interdisciplinary in that it's political communication and rhetoric. And so uh, I've grown up sort of in this interdisciplinary space, and uh, being in NCC has been a really interesting place over the years. I've also been dean of the program for a while, associate dean in charge of NCC. So uh, some of these problems that you're identifying are very real issues because it sounds great to work together, and you would think in an academic setting we would want to do that. Uh, think about how siloed so many of us are, where you sit in your spaces in your disciplines perhaps and don't get many opportunities to step out and associating with a center like this or with other programs on campus is a risk because you risk that time and excitement to be part of that at the same time you still have your responsibilities perhaps in your home discipline and so there's always this tension that operates in trying to uh, live in an interdisciplinary world, especially on this campus. What's interesting is that just in the 15 years almost that NCC has been around, there's been a real shift, I think, in interdisciplinary work on campus where we were sort of those pioneers out there kind of initially. Now, that's kind of the buzz. I, I sit at the Board of Visitors as a faculty rep and I hear a lot about this is an interdisciplinary program now, we're doing this interdisciplinary program. So a lot of people are doing this, which is exciting but at the same time while more of this is happening the system has not caught up yet has not changed to reflect that so a lot of it is this is good to do but don't forget to do that disciplinary good work as well and so there's this continual tension that I think uh, Lynn rightly identifies how many of you um, are in an interdisciplinary program here on campus now are assigned actually that's your job okay okay um, for the rest of you in regular disciplines okay uh, is this that side of the discipline? okay yeah. all right and some undisciplined and, some, <laughs> and you know, some of the transdisciplinary work he's talked about like how new disciplines or new fields develop such as gender studies you know could be a place where that has come together and formed a new way of looking at the world which I've heard other deans say well that's really just a new discipline rather than transdisciplinary so still wanting to go back to that sense of you know if it's discipline it's worthy if it's interdisciplinary it's too broad you're spread out you're not really delving deep into the question um, but I think that those of us who have lived in this space um, are sort of willing to take on some of those risks involved and uh, and embrace it, but the, but the problems are very real. Um, those of you who sit in interdisciplinary programs on campus um, may discover that it's really hard sometimes to find that space where you are going to publish, and, uh, and that is a real problem because you have to be out of these various conferences and, uh, and to gain that recognition. At the same time, you're letting go some of your discipline to do that, so there's a constant tension. I think those of us who sit here and these say that there's tremendous value. Uh, I know I've taught in learning communities and worked with scientists, mathematicians, social scientists, IT specialists, and it enriches the way we look at the world. I can't think of any more teaching a class by just taking a communication textbook and going through the chapters and focusing just on communication. Now it's looking at a problem and saying what are the best ways to solve that problem? And it may be some communication work, it may be sociology, it may be uh, gender work, whatever, but to taking around a problem rather than here's my discipline, I have to make sure certain things are covered. So, you know, I think the question, the big question to pose is, you know, those of you who um, either live in an interdisciplinary program here or think about doing this kind of research, you know, what are, what you see as some of the greatest challenges and barriers uh, to doing that? And also, if you are taking that kind of a focus, how do you approach research differently? What is the problem that you look at or think about in order to start doing this kind of work? So lots of good questions, and I think this is really why the center, um, the proposals that come are really important for interdisciplinary work, because we want to be talking to each other. We learn so much from each other when we take that time uh, to learn. Like, how do you look at the world differently? How do you approach this question? It's so rich and so 
you know, uh, able to increase consciousness. But how do we do that in this kind of a setting? This is a book that just came out in August. There's a chapter in here in NCC. It's a very interesting book about programs all over the country that have done interdisciplinary work where some programs have closed down because there's just not the resources to support them or have thrived and why. So it's an interesting book to look at you know, what some of those challenges are, but the point is that this is a large conversation happening nationwide um, that poses all kinds of issues for our campus. And I, I want to say that I'm going to send to Stacy um, a list of links that you can um, use to educate yourself about the history of some of this. And uh, there's some wonderful resources, um, including uh, bibliographies that you can access on the web, and I have a lot of that. Uh, plus, you can also take a look at the Charter of Transdisciplinarity, which was written actually in 1994 adopted at the first World Conference uh, Congress of Transdisciplinarity. So many of these things have been going on for many years and working their way outward. Um, and we'll be hearing a lot more about all of that. I wonder, I, 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 I sort of wonder as well whether we might look at this in a different way. Because in many ways, as someone who's spent quite a large part of her professional life outside the academy, Transdisciplinarity or interdisciplinarity in almost every workplace is taken for granted. It, it's something that happens um, it, because you, you pull together a group of people with very different educational backgrounds and often quite high level. I mean, you know, we're talking here about university research, but you know, I've worked in teams with people you know, who've got PhDs and masters and things like that, but from very but from very different disciplines. And we've worked together on projects. And it seems to me that maybe the academy could learn something from actually going out into the context where everybody takes being an interdisciplinary team or a transdisciplinary team for granted, you know? I mean, I think that in, in some ways, you know, it's, it, I think it's always good to push forward our boundaries and, and, and challenge ourselves. But on the other hand, there, there are many exemplars out there of, I mean, you know, you sit, sit in a board meeting, you know, you've got transdisciplinarity at work there. You know, how do we make profits for our company? And, you know, people are coming from many different backgrounds to that. Well, that's why this, this notion of transdisciplinarity that includes non-expert knowledge is so, is so uh, outrageous. I mean, it's an outrageous thing to propose that as a model to the university because that has always been, you know, you've always drawn a big circle around. Right. We're, we're right. making the assumption that the expert knowledge is in the university. That's right. Well, <laughs> uh, well our, yeah, our definition of expertise, you know, according to this idea of, of expert disciplines. But you're absolutely right. I mean, what, 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 what happens is that the university takes on the role that it initially had, that it was a part, it was a part of a larger society and not distinct from it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that may be too what, how, you know, if you look at some of the grant proposal requests that are coming out now, many of them are looking for interdisciplinary people working together, but they're also looking for partnerships with community, mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. community colleges, mm -hmm. as a way to, I think, recognize this and sort of shift some of that traditional way of thinking. You know, it's interesting because in, in universities we should be very forward thinking, but so much of our activity is, is pretty stagnant in terms of the way change happens. And so it's very hard to push forward some of these things unless maybe there's outside forces that are helping that. And sometimes some of those grant proposal requests are asking for those mm -hmm. things. Okay, I truly enjoyed this presentation. It was interesting, fascinating, and, and, and insp uh, very inspirational. So I thank you for this. And I'd like to make some our comments. I wish we had uh, Andy Sage here with us. He is uh, a kind of philosopher of science. He studied the issue of transdisciplinarity, and he proposed, of course, this concept of emergence of transdisciplinary knowledge in the context of knowledge integration. And I think that I agree with him. And the big picture is that when we consider knowledge, we have the entire spectrum. At one end, we have transdisciplinary knowledge. At the other end, we have 
multidisciplinary knowledge and multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary is somewhere between and of course it would be useful from our point of view to distinguish how to uh, how to uh, deal with uh, criteria for for moving from one end of spectrum to another one and it brings us to a concept of knowledge as such knowledge acquisition the concept of so-called knowledge soup, which was proposed some time ago, which may be interpreted as multidisciplinary knowledge put together. And of course, this transdisciplinarity, which directly leads to consciousness and human creativity. I recently wrote about it in a book. And basically, if you want to create the situation when new knowledge emerges, inventions occur, you are talking about the pro process of synesthesia as it is understood by Leonardo da Vinci, about a very complex cognitive process. And in this process, you integrate knowledge from several different domains. Like you develop an invention in the area of mechanical engineering, but you know, use knowledge from chemical engineering. But you use it not only in a mechanistic way, but change its context reformulate, uh, integrate, and from this point of view, this issue has tremendous potential, uh, potential impact. And personally, I would be very happy if we have maybe another meeting about, uh, about transdisciplinarity, directly in the context of consciousness, mm -hmm. human creativity, approaches in computer science. There is a theory of machine learning which deals with knowledge transmutations and we have of course knowledge specialization but also knowledge generalization and knowledge abstraction which are <coughs> described as specific operators mathematical operators which can be conducted on knowledge which may lead of course to transdisciplinary to transdisciplinary knowledge so i'm fascinated by this area and i i would really appreciate if we seriously think about another a talk on the subject and serious discussion and maybe again about our own unique for George Mason understanding what is the spectrum and uh, where we are. Yeah, I, you, you know, I think that the great thing about these brown bags is that they open up uh -huh. the places that we really need to explore. You know, just as consciousness, you know, we've only, we've only started Yes. to explore consciousness and the ways that we promote it. So yeah, I, I agree with you. I think I think we, we need a symposium yes. on transdisciplinary. Yes. Yeah. I wanted to go back to your point, Lynn, about the, the idea of obstacles. My research is on faculty roles and rewards, particularly in terms of doctoral students becoming faculty and then trying uh -huh. to become tenured and then even full professors. And one of the things that, that is in the literature is, of course, what we're all alluding to, is this idea of when we're evaluated, and we're all evaluated, whether or not it's for tenure or for whatever, we're evaluated for resources, which are even more scarce these days, so you can see even more of the impact going on. That's mine, that's mine. But this idea of, of discipline is not just a matter of where knowledge is, but where identity is. So when I said that I was not uh, interdisciplinary, I meant that almost tongue-in-cheek because I, I really do not have a program. And, and it becomes this thing of different people invite me into programs because where does Earl go? Well, one of the things I've learned to do in my own work is that I just stay, I call it peripheral. I stay peripheral to any specific discipline. However, that also means I'm not being fed through the, the different channels that other individuals might be fed. So we also have to think not just of the lack of resources and there are the problems with publication and then how does it get counted? If it's not in the top tier journal in my discipline, how does it count for tenure? Uh, that is a, a big problem in my field and I'm pretty sure it is. Now let's add one more thing to the mix that's going on right now. Sachs accreditation. Sachs has a rework some of the, the guidelines and the interpretation of those guidelines is becoming very problematic for this type of work because your PhD, your work must align with what you're teaching. 
Now, that just flies in the face of interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity. It also flies in the face of any professional development that might occur after you graduate. And I would like to hope that my colleagues are continuing to learn and changing, <laughs> you know, and that what I learned and, and graduated with in the 90s is not the same thing that I'm teaching in the 2000s. So the problems, when we say university, not to look at it as just uh, one institution, because faculty are not located, like they're in an institution at any given time, but we are evaluated nationally, internationally, we're located and can uh, reposition ourselves, but they have the same rules and expectations. I'm on a tenure review uh, committee right now, and of course we're looking at how the external reviewers are evaluating the scholarly work, not the work in the community. Mm -hmm. We all know that that gets positioned as a lesser type of knowledge that we scholars, we the experts, then translate into our scholarship. So I, I'm really acknowledging and I'm trying not to do something in a very negative way, but to make change we do have to acknowledge these barriers are there. And that's what I just wanted to comment on. Yeah, I mean that, that is a cry in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that's been you know as as part of the as part of the board of the center, um, you know, we've had we've had numerous conversations about you know all of these kinds of implications, and uh, you know it is. I I think that it is really the gift of the people who are involved with the center right now that they are they're they're trying to ask some of these questions at the root. You know, they're trying to, you know, trying to create a an understanding of what we're about here that allows us to take into account the institutional obstacles and at the same time insists upon the importance of moving forward into into paradigms that aren't supported yet. So I mean it's a real it's a real challenging situation. Would the center be, and, and I'm just I'm brainstorming here, yeah. I have no idea Absolutely. if this is feasible or appropriate, but I'm just going to throw out the idea, is that would it be appropriate for the center, for the board, or whoever, to develop a statement of affirmation of interdisciplinarity or of this type of thing that can then maybe lay out a few principles of what might be useful in terms of evaluation. So that those of us who are trying to evaluate fairly, because I have a situation right now, I pulled up the faculty handbook, and I love the faculty handbook. It gives me lots of answers, but it tells me exactly how to evaluate someone within a discipline. And so if we had those ways that those of us were trying to go beyond those obstacles to incorporate that, then we would at least have something in writing. Well, or at least a way to reinterpret what we are thinking we see in writing. I think the center could, you know, serve as a as a place to start some of these kinds of conversations. You know, it's it, NCC's tried to do some of this in various conferences and symposia because it really is a. I mean, next semester is going to be the theme of transformation, and we ought to talk about how do you transform the academic culture because that's a major job on this campus to get people to think differently about some of these things where, you know, it, it, the, that you only give credence to something in a peer-reviewed journal when, you know, people, many don't even create things in journals anymore. I mean, there's a really important uh, need to be thinking about some of these things and maybe the center Ram, can help some of Round bag number two next term is exactly on this. It's called, Is Education Transformational? And it, that's exactly mm -hmm. what it's about. It's about the institution and how it promotes and, and retards this kind the of institution has kind of a corporate ego. Yeah. And that's what that's what they that's what made all these disciplines happen. The exclusivity. It's the nature of political institutions and religions. My religion's better than your religion. You know, it's like uh, uh, survival. Yeah, right. Oh, that's it. But inter interdisciplinary things help to diffuse this corporate ego, but the, the corporation doesn't like it. No, and they're way more powerful they, than they any individual. They, they, they defend against it because it, it threatens survival. An interesting thing in chess is that there are 11 interdisciplinary programs now, where you see a very small number, 11 interdisciplinary programs. And 
when they when you go to promotion and tenure, there's one representative for that interdisciplinary group. And often that person has to leave the room if it's someone from their unit being talked about. So when P and T groups sit together, they're all disciplinary. They and so that's the way they're going to look at the world and they're going to count, you know, and and uh, and so and the the turf issues they get concerned about, you know, you're teaching this. Well, it kind of sounds like it ought to be in my unit, you know. Ego so, battle. <laughs> but but it is about transformation of consciousness because it, what you were, I'm so glad you brought up the term peripheral. I think we need to really understand that idea of what's core and what's peripheral. Yes. And when you also brought up the example of the nanotechnology, going from here and working your way out versus being out here and honing your way in. And that valuing both. And I think we don't we don't we don't do that. We don't flip core and periphery enough. Well, strangely you say that because one of the reasons I started using the term peripheral in the way I described myself in terms of my discipline was I was looking at a Venn diagram one day and realized that the core of the Venn diagram was actually the periphery of other. Yes. And so mm -hmm. I started exactly. realizing that I could exist in different places, pardon the pun, but I really could exist in different places as long as I positioned myself in relationship to those around me. And that was part of James Elkins's point in having us examine these kind right. of diagrams as a new a, a, mm -hmm. as an important part of understanding our world mm -hmm. and understanding how we communicate and think and uh, I, I think I think the idea that the model that we we come up with at the center could be one that affirms the transformation of us us who are the center mm -hmm. is a really important part of this. You know, our consciousness is mired in the way we've been educated. Do you know, I think this is a place where actually sort of publication and the scholarship of teaching and learning could, could be profoundly important um, in, in these kind of um, in, 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 in these kind of reformations, if you like, of, of consciousness or transformations of of consciousness, um, you know, because I, I, as you were talking, I was thinking about a research project that, that I was involved with, in, you know, that had people from very many disciplines, yet we were all honed in very closely um, on, a, on a particular problem. And, and that's where we've been trying to publish that, is a, a scholarship of teaching and learning. And, you know, again, I think that because there's more attention now paid within universities, it may still be lip service for a lot of universities and departments and disciplines at the moment. But there is a kind of a, a solid emerging core um, of, 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 of very crisp, clear work on the scholarship of teaching and learning that's built around this idea of transformation. And, and you know, that may be a place where we, where we make our push to, to sort of say, Okay, this, we have to think about this in a new way. We can't, we can't just, you know, trammel on the old way and, and become increasingly irrelevant to the rest of the world around us. That's a very, that's a very good point. You know, because as you say, there's lots of expertise outside of the university. <laughs> I was also fascinated that you brought up the idea of the, you know, how experiential learning and somatics space, and yet that's, again, that's the whole point of somatics, which is my area, is that you go from, from this embodiment to a generalized idea, that, that, that mm -hmm. then transfers outward, as opposed to starting and honing and honing and honing and honing and becoming more specialized. So, and it's, that's missing from, um, I think, most ways of looking at Disciplinary and multi-interdisciplinary. Well, I just I just keep hoping that the the university can embrace what for the last hundred years it has it has so religiously tried to exclude. Mm. That would be my hope. And you know, in the Center for Consciousness and Transformation, I mean, the core of the mission is to bring in a thing that has been religiously, no pun intended, excluded <laughs> from, you know, from, from the heart of our, our study. You know, we, 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 we rigidly exclude 95% of our students' experience, and often our own, in an enterprise that takes up the bulk of our emotions and, and, uh, and concerns of life. And so, and we lock consciousness within four walls as well, where exactly. for, for many people consciousness is now distributed. That's exactly right. And that's why the importance of technology at the heart 
of the, the concept of transdisciplinarity. Um, it, is, it is helping us to rethink you know, ourselves as wetware. <laughs> <laughs> We, I was having a discussion in one of my classes, and where, where it made me think about it, uh, the author w w uh, William Mitchell uh, called human beings squishy nodes. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we were the squishy nodes in the network. <laughs> well, I, I, I thank all of you for the fun that we had. This is, uh, it's only the beginning of this conversation.